this is Hang Bull Mun, a senior cloud advocate at Microsoft. Uh, this is what we know about him. He's specializing in artificial intelligence and Azure with a background in application development. He is currently a part of the regional cloud advocate team in the Netherlands, and we were here about building accessible experiences with AI. Now, before I let Hank begin, just a friendly reminder that if you have a question, you can type it in on Pine in the chat section. And at the end of the section, uh, session, I will pass them on to Hank and we can discuss more. Now, without further ado, Hank. Thank you. Hi, everyone, and welcome to my session, Building Accessible Experiences with AI. Um, before we start, did you know you can follow this um, presentation in more than 100 languages real time? So let me show you before we start how you can set that up for your presentation and then you can actually join in um, in a translated experience. So you can do that by using the Microsoft Translator. So you go to translator.microsoft.com, you say, you start a new conversation or you create uh, join a preset one which I've already created we just say start start yes we want to start it we connect a microphone to our laptop and then now here we should be able to follow everything I'm saying and you can join by scanning this QR code selecting your language that you want to have the translation in, and then just see what I'm saying in your language. And you can actually have that spoken to you in your language. So you can put on your headphones and listen to me in your own language. So this is starting and running in the background. So now we can actually start with my presentation. So my name is Henk Boelman and I'm a cloud advocate at Microsoft, indeed based in the Netherlands. And my job is to make everyone successful with AI on the Microsoft stack. You can follow me on Twitter, read some, um, I post a lot of articles, you can see where I speak. You can find a lot of code samples, including the code samples for this presentation on my GitHub. And if you want to read a little bit more in depth articles, you can go to my blog where I explain this um, technology a bit more in depth. So in this session, we're going to talk about kind of AI building blocks to make your applications more accessible. But why? Why do we want to make our applications more accessible? And the answer is, 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 is quite um, out there. Because over one billion people on the world in the world have, facing, um, have a disability. And that is a big part of the audience that can use your applications. So, there, there of course, there are a lot of different types of disabilities and there is always a different solution for all these uh, types of disabilities. So there's visual, hearing disability, those are the quite obvious things you can do, but there is also cognitive, um, speech, mobility, neural, and sometimes it is even a combination of all those disabilities, like for instance, for the Parkinson, Parkinson disease. And when we talk about disability, we have to realize that we should not name it like a personal health condition. We should see it as a mismatch with human interaction because it is a human made problem because Wheelchairs don't make a building accessible. It are the stairs that actually make the building inaccessible for those people. And finally, we are all going to be disabled at a certain point in time. And some just beat us to it. I like that quote from my colleague. So when I think about accessibility, it is the design of products and services and environments so that everyone, including people with disabilities, can fully experience. It's not that you bolt on 
to your application. You should think of from the start to make your application accessible for everyone. And if you design for accessibility, like the first audiobooks were like really for, for blind people to also give them access to that content, that technology we all use now while we are running, when we're in the car, it is a better experience for everyone. And one more example. There are some examples from um, in Teams, like some features you see, and you're like, whoa, that is cool. So did you know that like the blur background actually was invented and made for people who were deaf and at HDHD so that they can focus only on the face and not be distracted by everyone's amazing backgrounds at home with all the little toys and all the little things? Um, the caption were of course there, the transcripts, video recordings were even um, invented for accessibility purposes because you can also think of accessibility by accessible for everyone that is not in the same time zone as you. So a lot of things emerge from being accessible. So in this presentation, I want to show you some like kind of building blocks that you can use in your applications by, and we're going to talk of how we can make sense of the world with computer vision and speech recognition. And for that, we're going to use the Microsoft AI stack. And we're going to pick some different like kind of items from the shopping list that Azure has to offer for that. So we have Azure Apl Applied AI Services. These are like top level services which you see in the translator um, website, the experience from. Then that are mostly consist of implemented Azure Cognitive Services. And if you need a very specialized model, you can use Azure Machine Learning for that. That is, that is our offering where you can just train your own models. But we are going to use, uh, look at some Azure Applied AI services and some Azure Cognitive Services that can really help you. So Microsoft Cognitive Services, they're divided in four regions. There's vision, speech, language, and knowledge. So there is vision to make your application see speech to make your application talk and listen to you, language to understand what is being spoken or typed, and knowledge if you want to tap into the knowledge of the internet and give your application a little brain. So enough slides. So let's start with some demos from these services. So everything I'm going to show you today is in Python, and you can uh, download all these Python scripts, all these Jupyter notebooks that run a Visual Studio code in, uh, from my GitHub, which I shared at the end of the presentation. So the only thing I've done is installed some SDKs, some Cognitive Services SDKs. So these ones are available in Java, in Python, in um, .NET, and probably some other languages that I forget now but they're available in the language of your choice. So we'll start with importing a lot of dependencies and a lot. And like with every um, Azure resource, you need to create a resource in Azure and get an API key. So I've already done that because we don't like to see people clicking in the Azure portal. So I have an endpoint. This can be in the region of your choice and I have a subscription key. From that, I'm going to create a computer vision client. And with that client, I can start looking at images. For instance, at this image. This is a street in Amsterdam. But as you can understand, not everyone is able to see these kind of images. So I can generate a description for those images people sitting on, a ben on benches in a city. So that is what it sees on the image. And that is actually somehow true with our stairs, but 
at least it is giving an idea of what it is. And this functionality is also implemented in PowerPoint. So you can click on an image in your PowerPoint and say, hey, generate this description for me. So by using this implemented service in PowerPoint, you're already making your PowerPoint a little bit more accessible for people who cannot, cannot see what is on the image. But just one click. But you can go a little bit further. You can actually start detecting which objects are on this image. So we run it, and then we see like, hey, there is a person here. It is actually recognizing our weird Dutch bicycles. Um, there are some persons here. There is a person here. There is a small bicycle there. So it can actually now tell you, hey, I see this many people, people with bicycles. So you can generate a description of these objects. But as I said, it doesn't always really work because this is not the information. It actually says um, person up here, speaking a random color. Um, so here we have a problem. It says, I see a person, but actually we want to hear that it is seeing a banknote. And in many cases that will, will happen because the computer vision API is a general API. So what we can do is we can actually train our own models to quickly detect what is on images. And for that, we have a service called the Azure Custom Vision Service. It is also an API, and you can completely control that with code. There is also an interface to customvision.ai where you can go to and start uploading your images. But I'm a developer. I want to have everything in code. So I like to type it out so everyone can recreate this, um, this example. So I'm starting to train. I have a data set of Indian banknotes. And I'm creating another custom vision training client. I can, when I start training, I can choose a domain. So what kind of objects am I, am I going to train? Am I going to train very specific food, uh, landmarks, or is it more a general domain? So you see here behind, you see a repeat of those domains, and you see compact. Actually, this uh, domain models you can actually export to um, like your iPhone to run natively in CoreML or in TensorFlow or um, Windows ML to Onyx. So then you need to select one of these domains. I'm just going to select general because this is quite a general uh, problem. So we're going to create a project. We are going to loop through all the images. Um, and tag them. So I have a folder, like that says a 100 node with 10 images in it, 200 node with 10 images in it. And it's going to loop through there. It's creating a tag, and it is uploading it. And we have amazing internet here. So it went really fast. So let's have a look at this data set. So and here we are. These are some Indian banknotes. So we're going to start the training, and then we are going to wait for it. So this can take a while, but at least the training is started. So let's move over to the custom vision web service where we can actually follow what is, uh, what is going on. So we have here, um, I will refresh it. And then we should see all my projects and the newly created project. This is less fast than I expected. So here we see our, our project. Here we see all the images, the text on the, on the, on the left, 100, 200, 50, 10 node. We see all the different nodes, different angles, front, back. And I've used not enough images to create a perfect model. So if you're doing this for yourself, you need around 50 images. Um, per class, so per tag, to make this go well. So under performance, you see the iterations you've done. So this one is actually training now. And it should be done in a few minutes. So let's hope that actually works. But I've already trained another one, which we can actually test. Um, so what we see here is you need to upload images with like kind of different backgrounds. Because if you upload everything with the same background, it is trying to learn to classify your background instead of the object that is on it. 
So you want to do that. You want to have it from different angles, and you want to have it with like kind of the right light source. You don't want to have them too dark. You don't want to have them too light, so it can really see all the features in the in the image. So what I'm training now is a classification project. And this classification project will look at the wall image. So I just want to see see the wall image, everything that is on there. And it will tell you, um, I'm like 90% sure that this is like a 100 node. I'm like 30% sure that I see on this wall image like a 10 node. There is also another project that you can train. And that is an object detection project. And that will actually tell, hey, I see this node and this node within this bounding box. So while we are waiting for this training to, uh, to be done, um, let's see if it is already done, should be done now. And it's only two minutes. Um, let's zap to the, let's zap to already a created project. Here is the banknotes. We can do a quick test. So basically, you can do this in code, and you can do this through the interface. We can browse. We can go to my um, to my demo folder. Banknotes, the test data set, and let's try a 200 node. And here it, you see it classifies. Like I'm 64% sure that this is a 200 node. The cool thing what you can do now is, you will find it back under predictions. Here you see all the predictions I've done. Because you send this to an API, you can actually add them to your data set and use it in the next round um, of training. So you can grow your database by like user added images. You can also disable it, because sometimes you have like GDPR images and then you don't want to have them. But both options are possible. So I really hope this starts training very soon. Oh, four minutes. Cool. So I can show you one of these object detection projects. So I have one with um, with Simpson images. And if you're going to do object detection, you need like a lot more images than like 50 only. So here I have an object detection project with five classes. And you see, I have 545 images for every class. So if I here look at Bart Simpson, I also actually had to tag where this figure was, uh, was in. Um, but under predictions, let's see, I don't have a Simpsons image on me. So I really want this to uh, training complete. Perfect. <laughs> so when the training round is complete, you publish your model to the endpoint, and then you can start doing predictions against it. So now we're doing actually the predictions in a loop over the test set image to our API. And it should draw a nice um, image for it from it. It had only 10 images. You can do it. Or not. Yes, here we are. Perfect. So here we see we have 100 image, 200 image, 500, 2,000, 50 node. So this can be done in eight minutes. So but we have also different type of images. Here we have our prime minister, prime minister and we want to know who is on the image. So this custom vision of the computer vision API can also look at faces. We saw in the other thing that I just described, it is a person. But sometimes we just want to know a little bit more about that person. 
So what it can do here is it sends the image to the API, and then it can tell us, hey, this is a male, and we think he is like 49 years old, and this is another male with 48 years, who is 48 years old. But we can also detect if they are famous enough and are in the celebrity database. And our prime minister actually is called Mark Rutte, and with a single API call, it can tell you who is there. But not everyone is um, famous enough to, to be in the database. So you can, uh, there's also an API that can help you train your own face model. So again, you go to the Azure portal, create a face API endpoint and get an API key, connect, create a face uh, client, and then let's see if we can train a model that can actually detect and describe these uh, people on the, on the image. So the face API can tell you a little bit more about the faces than, um, than the computer vision API. Computer vision API just tells you it's a male and I think it's 14, and he's 49 years old. But this one, this API can actually tell you a lot about the person. If the person is smiling, what the guest age is, if someone has to shave, yes or no, if he's wearing glasses can classify between like normal glasses, sunglasses, and swimming goggles. Um, if you're wearing makeup, and here we see that, and it can classify the emotions of a person. So this can be like really helpful for uh, blind people if they take a picture of the room and they see, say, hey, there are like 10 people actually looking happy at you, and not like 10 people are looking like really angry at you. Um, so, but still, this still is a GUI ID. So what we can do is we can actually train this API by giving one example per person. So here I have some other images from all these classes, from all these people, and I'm going to create a group, a face group. In that face group, I'm going to create persons, and at every person I'm going to add an image containing the face. I'm going to train that face group. And the training of face groups goes very fast. We don't have to wait eight minutes for that. And then, oh, training is complete. And now we can actually identify the people on the image. So we find again all the faces, get back a list of algorithms, and then we can ask, hey, do you know who this person is? Do you know who this person is? And then it matches it to Luke, Phil, and Alex, and we can actually overlay that on the image, so now we know who they are in the image. So, but that is not all. We can also start reading text in images with one single API call. So here we have a slide with such an Adela's quote from the Ability Summit. This is a great summit, a great event, if you want to learn more about accessibility within Microsoft and the broader community. But we just want to extract everything that is on that image to make it more accessible. So here we see it has found all the lines where the text is. So you get back in JSON the bounding boxes from this text and all the actual words. But what about handwriting? Because not everything is typed. So here I have the same code, but then I've written it down with a like, very thick black marker and fair handwriting, if I say myself. So the API can do the same for handwriting. Accessibility empowers everyone, and a little extra space. And it will also tell you for your handwriting where everything is. So these are really great tools to make like kind of sense with a few API calls about what you're seeing on images. But you can think more. This can also be on a camera stream. You can run these models on every frame and see what is going on and then feed it to a speech API so that it will talk to you and describe, hey, I'm seeing five persons. I'm seeing this. I'm seeing this. So that is really cool. So what we have seen in this notebook, we have seen computer vision. You can use computer vision to describe images, 
to detect objects, to detect faces, and detect famous people. We have custom vision, where you can train your own model for your own images. We have a face API that can describe faces, tell about emotions, about ages, about hair colors. Um, we can, and we can train that on our own data set with our own people we know. But it would also be good to make more sense of the world with speech. So there is also, this was like the vision department, there is also a wall speech department. And I'm going to show you some demos from there. We of course start with installing Python packages, as always. Then this is the sentence we are going to um, let the computer speak to us. We have a speech SK and a service region. And then we have a few choices. So I'm going to start with a... Accessibility empowers everyone. Accessibility and inclusion are essential to delivering our mission to empower every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more. So this is kind of boring if you listen to it. It's like very roboty that is trying to tell you. So a few months ago, or maybe even longer than a few months ago, they released something like neural speech. And we can actually listen to Accessibility, Accessibility empowers everyone. everyone. Accessibility and inclusion are essential to delivering our mission to empower every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more. So this actually sounded a lot better and a lot more, um, more like a real person. But we can do more. We can actually listen in real time and get translations out. It's kind of what you saw in the translator app. It is all available through some APIs. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to start the script that's going to listen to me and then it should translate me into Dutch and in the local language here. Accessibility empowers everyone. It's up to you to say if that is a correct translation or not. It's not up to me. But in Dutch it is, 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 <laughs> it is kind of correct. So uh, now we have it in text. We see it is only a few lines of code that can actually do this for us, and we can add more and more and more languages. But you can also make it actually generate WAV files in all the different languages, and then actually make it talk back to you. So here we're going to create some WAV files with the Dutch language, the English language, the local language here, and um, Chinese. Accessibility empowers everyone. And then we can open. Accessibility empowers everyone. That's what I said. PAM bedoelt de specifieke vrienden. Toegankelijkheid stelt iedereen in staat. Voor toegang dan voor je mee te zijn. Accessibility empowers everyone. So. Hank, just before you continue, we have some requests. There's appeared to be a mistake that you're trying to translate into local language, but you're translating into our neighbor's language, oh. Latvians. <laughs> so they're just asking if we could change that from LB to LT. LB to LT. LV to LT. Okay. That is my mistake. I'm really sorry. But then I probably have to look up the voice that can actually speak that language. Okay, so this is the link to our Microsoft Docs. Because every person has a name <laughs> that will speak it out. Um, I will update the demo, I will promise you, and then I will, uh, I will do that. I will post it later in the chat. 
Perfect. So this is what I want to see. It can translate in languages and also in not a local language. Um, let me see. I was at the end of the demo. So the next thing I want to talk to you about is services that apply those AI building blocks. Like I want to talk to you about Azure Media Services, which can really help you make your streams accessible. And I want to um, talk to you about Video Analyzer that can help you add translations to your videos later on. So time for more demos. Um, so let's go here to the browser and let's start about, uh, talk about Azure Media Service. So Azure Media Services is a great tool if you want to do some live streaming. You can create a live stream same as you would do in YouTube or Vimeo or any other provider. Um, so you can create a live event and the cool thing is, is that you can select in which language you want to have your captions in real time under your video. So here we say, let's say, build stuff. We're going to go for high encoding, RTMP. We will use the static host. We will start, not start, we will start the live event. We will go next to advanced. We will say, not enable a live transcription. We say English, United States. So there are a lot of languages you can uh, you can choose from. Review and create. And now it will create an endpoint where you can send your stream to using a program called OBS or vMix or any other program that can generate an RTMP feed. So we see my event is starting up. And in the meantime, while it is starting up, I can um, go to OBS, go to settings, to stream at my endpoint with my streaming key. Say OK. And let's see if it is starting up. Should be up and running. Mostly take like 30 seconds to a minute for it to start. is accepting my stream and in a little while we should see that it's detecting it always crashes the first time so you always have to play reload click reload player a few times before the encoder starts working so here we see my frame I will actually start streaming we have to create an output so now we have an input that is coming in so the next thing we need to do is create an output where it is going to put the the, the transcoded files create a streaming locator okay now we have a url uh, i need this this one See here how many people we can actually connect to the to my stream. We can reload this player, or we can go directly to the sample player here. And actually, put this in. I've already added the uh, the caption track. Say update player, and with a little bit of luck, if I click the right at once. Have more power. It's transcribing it real time through the encoder from my OBS machine here with the latest so tomorrow, tomorrow 30 is here. seconds. Today. What, what will you do? What will you do with it? So this is really useful if, if you have an online conference and you want to generate automatic uh, captions. And the good thing is this is only around four euros an hour. So 
So let's pause it and let's stop streaming. Let's stop the live event. And now it is automatically archived. And you can use this file to, um, to embed on your website in the same player with the same captions that you have generated. But sometimes these captions are not really that perfect and you need to edit them. So later on what you can do is you can go to Azure Video Analyzer for Media, which was previously called Video Indexer, because we like to rename things at Microsoft. So it is now called Azure Video Analyzer for Media. So what you can do there is you can upload a video and then it will start running all these AI models on all the video frames. It will extract the people who are in your, in your videos and actually where and when they are in your video. It will generate topics, audio effects, it's highlighting keywords if you talk a little bit too much about the same thing. It labels it, it um, detects emotions like apparently people are scared in this video um, or sad. But one of the cool things is, is that you can actually set, hey, let's give me this in, uh, in English, because it was in Dutch. And now it will generate everything again. Uh, of course, I knew that it was going to happen someday during the presentation. So here we are again. Hey, my, my name, name is Thor. I am a woman. We don't want to play it. So here we can say, let's translate it to Danish. What we'll do is it will translate, translate the whole, uh, whole transcription, the whole subtitles it had generated. And we can now download our closed captions in Danish. We can also edit them. We can also view the transcript. Oh, here the timeline. And make some adjustments so that all the weird words are uh, are out and automatically in the player you can now select hey i want to have danish captions here Maybe Maybe I felt to make it easier you, know, you can just embed this video you can embed the insight you can embed the player and you can embed the editor in your own applications So that brings us to the end of my presentation. So the Seeing AI app for Microsoft is one of these apps that combines all these cognitive services and more that um, I've showed you today. You can find a video on YouTube or go to this website and learn more about this app. You can download it and this app will actually try to make sense of the world by a camera and a microphone for you. So I want to leave you with a few things, like for if you want to embed or make your applications more accessible. So I want you to start asking these type of questions when you make your next application. So who am I building this for? And also actually look who is in my team? Who am I building it with? Because if you want to design and include everyone, everyone should be represented in your development group, in the software creation process. And who can experience my application or the thing that I'm building? Is it limited to the people without a disability? Can someone that has an eyesight actually use my application? So think of adding alt text to your website. Already that makes a huge difference for people who use screen readers. Use captions. I've showed you in two minutes how easy it is to add captions to a video stream. Add captions to your recording with Video Indexer. And for your website, you can use Accessibility Insights. Just run it in the browser, just a fast pass. And like you see on the left side, PowerPoint can do and solve a lot of these things for you 
automatically. And ask yourself, who am I unintentionally excluding? Because we never get it right at the first time. So make sure everyone has a way to participating in your show. If you put it out to show, you think, can everyone enjoy this? And also, when you run a conference or do something, show that you have accessibility features. Let not people ask you, hey, do you have captions? Have a section on your website, these are the accessibility requirements I've, I've done, implemented in my application. Or these are the accessibility um, I have for my venue, for my online event, for my local event. It is very normal to say, we have an elevator in our building. Our building is wheelchair accessible. Why don't we do that with online conferences and our platforms we create? So don't hide them, just show them. And ask people if this is what they needed. I have an example, I've added sign language to my, uh, to my first streams. I was very happy, I thought it was accessible. The sign language interpreter was so small, nobody could see or understand it. So the only thing you can learn is to ask feedback. And then I learned it is nice to actually have a separate stream. So people can have the sign language on the second screen. So you have your normal screen and the sign language interpreter on the second screen. Um, so every time with software development, you iterate and you get better and better. The more inclusive you are, the more innovative you can be. So thank you everyone. If you want to have my dear demo in the right language, go in about an hour to my GitHub. And if there are any questions, then this is kind of the moment. We have no questions online, but I have a microphone I can pass along if there are any here. There we go. The live event, you showed uh, the live uh, subtitles yeah. in one language. Yeah. Is it possible to add two or three languages? Not yet. Not yet. No. Okay, thanks. I hope that will come very soon. Yeah, so I have a question here because that translation over to Danish was not super impressive. So uh, I was wondering, is it, I mean, will it be improved with time or how does that work? Every service is improved with time. <laughs> No, yeah, they're, they're constantly working on adding more languages, making the translation better, understanding context. Yeah. So that will hopefully improve. For the Dutch one, it is actually getting better and better. You can really see the difference between like five years ago and what is out there now. Ah, that's a far away one. Everybody, let's join in this. Can you pass on the microphone? Uh, hi, I really like the facial recognition one, and I was thinking, in the current situation, have you tried it with uh, masks? How does it work? Does it recognize <laughs> the facial expressions? It will absolutely not recognize a facial expression because it will use the, the, the corners of your mouth, of course, as an indicator. I don't think it will really work at the moment at, um, with masks on it because it needs all those identifiers. All right. I guess we're out of questions. Hank, before I let you go, I just wanted to ask one more thing. What inspired you to do what you do right now? <laughs> okay, that is a long story. But it comes down that a lot of people in my family, in my also in my personal life, I had to deal with the mismatched like kind of situation between me and, and, and the rest of the world. And it kind of kind of pained always to see like my brother is blind, not be able to actually file his own college application because somebody didn't think of making the form accessible for him so that he could enter it with a screen reader. For me, the wheelchair building, I've been in a wheelchair for years. Um, 
the people at my school, I was like a 12-year-old boy, and they found it normal to kind of lift me up the stairs when you were 12 and in high school, because they just didn't have an elevator in the building. And I remember my mother then was like really pissed, and I was like, hmm, I can also experience it. But that kind of um, drove me to kind of talk about this kind of making everything accessible in my in my in my reach to help to help everyone and make better experiences. Well, th that's very noble, Hank. <laughs> <laughs> Applause for that, and thank you very much.